Hi folks, I wanted to make a video covering how to do a generator inlet connection into your home and demonstrate what's worked well for me. But first, I guess when you do one of these, people like to see the finished result first. So this is pretty much my final setup. A pair of inverter generators team together in an enclosure. The enclosure is actively ventilated with 12 volt DC automotive fans that plug directly into the front panel of the generators. And because the generators are drawing a significant volume of air through their enclosures, by making a reasonable seal around the output and the exhaust, it also helps to pull air in from the enclosure and kind of assist the fans and work with a strategically placed vent that I have. The power line runs out of a small trap door in the bottom and connects to a 50 amp inlet into my home and the inlet connects into the main breaker box via a 50, or in my case, a 60 amp breaker that's used basically as a switch. Breakers are really nothing more than just switches that will automatically turn themselves off if too much power passes through. So the generator connection to my home can be switched on and off with this breaker, but you never wanna have generator power and line power on at the same time, so we have an interlock here to prevent exactly that scenario. If you're considering something like this and aren't sure what hookups to get or how to get started, that's what this video is going to be about. So let's start at the beginning. You know you want to be able to run your home on generator power, but there needs to be some groundwork done first, starting with how much power do you need and what kind, specifically a 240 volt or 120 volt system. 120 volt generators can run lights and refrigerators, computers and such, but will not be capable of running larger 240 volt appliances. These are things like your stove or your central air conditioning units. Things actually get more complicated when using only a 120 volt generator in this way because almost every residential breaker box is designed for 240 volt power. And you'll need to work out what circuits will receive your generator power. This most often involves what's called a transfer switch, which I'll touch on in a moment. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, because for me, that was overly complicated and expensive, so not the route that I took. The other kind of power is going to be 240 volt AC. This actually simplifies the connection into your home, because your generator power matches exactly the kind of power that you're already receiving from the electric company. You don't have to do anything special, and basically you're just swapping out line power for generator power and using your home's existing wiring for everything. 240 volt AC inverter generators are relatively rare, so that's one of the reasons I really like these Predator 9500s. Or if you want natural gas as an option and a really neat remote start, the Durabax XP9000IH is almost identical, but costs about $300 more. So if you want the option to be able to run 240 volt appliances and such, we're talking your central AC, electric ranges, uh, electric water heaters, maybe electric dryers, things like that, then your decision's made. You're going to need a 240 volt capable generator. Now remember that a 240 volt generator doesn't mean that you only get 240 volts. Just like your normal electric power, it will also happily and safely run your 120 volt lights and appliances, outlets, etc. as well. In almost every residential home in America, power comes in in what's called split phase, meaning there are two primary cables, an X and a Y, that when measured between them provides 240 volts AC. There's also a third cable called a neutral that's a split between them. So either X or Y to neutral will give you 120 volts AC, half the voltage. In your breaker box, you'll have both legs, and a leg that feeds a breaker slot alternates on the way down, X, Y, X, Y, X, Y. So the position of your of a 120 volt breaker in the box determines which leg is providing that 120 volt power to your lights and outlets. This is also why 240 volt breakers are double width. They need two slots, so they get each of the legs, and that way they can obtain their power from both the X and the Y combined, giving you that 240 volts. In my home, I have a split breaker box design, meaning that outside where the power comes into my home, I have some breakers, which in my case are all my 240 volt circuits, covering things such as my air conditioner or the air conditioner compressor, the air handler, hot water, uh, oven, the clothes dryer, things like that. And one of those 240 volt circuits splits off and goes to a panel that's in my garage, which contains all the breakers for the various lights and outlets throughout the home. So the first thing we need to figure out is how we're going to safely bring power in. The actual connection type we'll touch on last, but right now we're talking about how to safely switch from line power to generator power. If you're hooking up a generator, it's absolutely critical that your generator can never be connected at the same time that your power from the power company is also connected. If your power is on and the two are combined at the same time, it could do spectacularly bad things to your generator and your home appliances. 
If the power company feed is down and your generator is powering your home, but the circuit is still connected to line power, that means in addition to your home, you're also sending power out to the universe, such as your neighbors, and potentially energizing lines that are thought to be off and risks killing a lineman working on power that's supposed to be deactivated. Plus, when the power does eventually come back on, we're back to spectacularly bad things happening to your home and generator. So never, ever, ever have your generator connected at the same time that your line power from the street is also connected. So how do you avoid this? Well, two primary ways. The first is by using a transfer switch. These are more often utilized in single breaker box systems where you have one power box for your whole home. Basically, the switch cuts the flow of power from the incoming line and switches over to power from the generator feed. Many of these also let you manage what circuits receive power. If you plan on only using a 120 volt generator, you'll probably be best served by using one of these. Often they'll also include usage meters allowing you to monitor your various energy loads. These are a lot more complicated to hook up as all your power has to pass through this thing first before reaching your main breaker box. And depending on the size of your home's connection, many of these boxes can't handle passing through the full 200 amp electric service that most modern homes now receive. So the other method, it's called an interlock. That's what I used. Interlock is a fancy word for a slidey metal plate thing. The idea here is that you attach a metal plate designed specifically for your breaker box that will physically block your breakers from a combination that would allow your main power and the breaker coming from your generator feed to be on at the same time. They make different versions for different breaker boxes, and you'll need to find one that fits yours and make sure your breaker is in the right position for this all to work. But basically, it's just a flat piece of metal that's vastly overpriced at around $70, but really absolutely simplifies safely and legally connecting up your generator because now you just have to install a new breaker dedicated to your generator feed, four wires, versus a big transfer switch that's completely rewiring your entire setup. So basically, if the breaker inlet is on and the generator is hooked up, then your main power is off. It's disconnected. They physically can't be on at the same time because the plate blocks the position of the breakers. If you need to manage what circuits are energized, you can do that by turning off your normal breakers or just manually making sure things are turned off in your home and on generator power. Next, how do we actually get the generator power to the breaker box? Well, you could hardwire it, but most people want a more portable or disconnectable system, which involves what's called an inlet. This is the plug that you actually connect the generator cable to. Inlets will consist of some scary looking male pins, which are only used for receiving power. This is further a reason why you want the interlock, which is to ensure that that breaker switch for these pins can never be on when your line power is on, because if they were, those exposed pins would be energized with 240 volt power. There are two primary types of inlets used for 240 volt generator home hookups. A 30 amp, referred to as a L14-30P. It has four pins in a circular pattern that kind of locks in with a slight twist of the female connector. Usually your generator will have a matching female port on the front panel and your extension cord simply connects the two. My Predator generators are equipped with this 30 amp port. And if you have a gas home, you may be able to get away with just this style of hookup in a single generator. The other and probably more common type is a 50 amp hookup, which can be a little confusing because most of the time a different plug is used on a generator versus on the inlet of the home. This socket can be referred to by a number of different designations depending on if it's for marine use or typically it'll be called something like an SS2-50P. This is also a rounded plug that locks in with a slight twist, but the 240 volt version will be physically larger than the 30 amp one and it only has three pins with a ground on the side. And sometimes there's a metal pin in the middle that seems to be optional and doesn't really you know, matter. Often there's a very nice spinning ring on the plug that can help secure it in place. And I highly suggest using an extension cord and inlet with that feature. Otherwise the heavy 50 amp cable can easily torque the socket to the side and inadvertently disconnect the power. Most generators, however, will not have this type of plug. And instead for the 50 amps, we'll have a plug everyone refers to as a dryer plug because it's well used on dryers. The actual designation of which is a 14 50. The addition of the P to any of these names indicates it's a male plug, while the R designation indicates it's a female receptacle. So your generator with a 50 amp plug will typically have a 14-50R socket needing a 14-50P cable to plug in. And the other end of that cable will end in a SS2-50R socket, which connects to the SS2-50P male plugs on your home inlet. I told you it was confusing. 
Basically, around SS2-50R for the house, and expect the generator to have a 14-50R socket dryer plug, and you'll need a cord to connect the two together. The basic rule is whatever is carrying power will always be female because the metal contact points are protected from being accidentally touched. So which do you need for your home? Well, calculating your loads and needs is a huge part of this, but the short rule of thumb, if you have a gas home with minimal 240 volt appliances, you may be able to get away with a 30 amp inlet in a single generator but it will depend on if you want to run your AC and how big it is. I made the mistake of starting out using a 30 amp inlet and quickly realized it was going to be very insufficient for my all electric homes needs, at which point I then had to completely start over and upgrade to a 50 amp. So if you have an all electric home like I do, trust me, just go straight to the 50 amp inlet. And frankly, if you're gas, why limit yourself? The cost difference between the two types of plugs is minimal. So going with a 50 amp allows you to adapt down to a single 30 amp generator socket if you need to, but you have the option of upgrading later to a 50 amp generator without having to modify your home. So the, the decision should be pretty easy. My advice, learn from my mistake and just opt for the 50 amp inlet and you're future proofed. Ultimately, your job will be to determine how much stuff you need to be able to run and how much you can do without. Once you have those numbers, then you can look up what capacity you need in terms of a generator. Just remember that most generator manufacturers advertise their maximum surge power as opposed to the capacity it can support continuously. The Predator 9500 I have is no exception, advertising 9,500 watts when it actually makes 7,600 continuously. So be sure that you're finding a generator or generators that at least slightly exceed the capacity you think you'll need. Either way, for 240 volts, your plug will connect into the main box with four wires, red, black, white, and green. For a 50 amp plug, you'll need a minimum of six gauge, lower, which is to say thicker, cable to make those connections. You'll also need to install a breaker. Usually they just pop in very simply and then you know, the wires screw directly into the breakers. That breaker needs to be sized appropriately for your inlet, 30 amp or 50 amp. And then you connect your two hot legs, the red and black, into your new shiny 240 volt breaker, while the white and the ground will typically connect into a bus bar on the side. This smart part may be different from home to home. To protect the wires, you'll need to either directly connect the inlet to the breaker box or use conduit. I use this 50 amp inlet for my setup, and it has a locking ring and a little nice power indicator light. It was connected via a short length of flex conduit from my local Lowe's. This conduit is referred to as an air conditioning whip and is designed for connecting air conditioning compressors, but works really well for this purpose as well, particularly because you don't have to buy a whole roll of the conduit. I ended up using a sliding plate interlock to prevent my main incoming power breaker from being on at the same time as the generator inlet breaker. It should go without saying, but I'll say it anyway, be sure the main breaker is off before doing anything in this box and keep in mind that the power coming in from the road typically can't be turned off unless the power company does it for you, so there's always going to be some hot wires in here. Be careful. If you have any doubts or don't have the tools, hire a professional. Ultimately, for my setup, I ended up building out an enclosure to hold everything on my porch from which I can easily connect up the power and switch things over. This particular project turned out to be a huge pain in the butt, and I can't suggest highly enough to consider modifying some type of plastic shed enclosure as an option unless you've got plenty of time, patience, and woodworking tools. But ultimately, it worked out, and I think I've got a pretty solid setup. Well, that was a ton of info, and I hope it was helpful for people out there considering this. Throw any questions in the comments, and I'll do my best to answer them. And please be careful when dealing with your breaker box. There is deadly power in there, some of which, again, cannot be turned off. So if you have any doubts about your safety, please, please hire a professional. Have a great day, and I hope this was helpful.